Jennifer Doulos was born on September 27, 1968, in New York City. Thanks to her banker father, she grew up in luxury and money was just never an issue. From a young age, Jennifer had a passion for writing and decided to pursue a literary career. After graduating from the prestigious Brown University in 1990, she attended New York University and completed a master's degree in writing. She once wrote that she wanted home, family and fresh cut flowers. But fast forward to 2003, Jennifer was still single. But at just 25 years old, she knew that time was on her side. Then that same year, Jennifer was in Aspen Airport when she had a chance encounter with a man she had met during her first week at Brown University. Fotis Doulos was born to Greek parents in Istanbul, Turkey in 1967. When he was seven years old, he moved to Athens with his family. By the time he was a teenager, Fotis was dreaming of a life somewhere more culturally diverse. And in 1986, he moved to the US. After studying economics and mathematics at Brown University, Fotis completed an MBA in finance at Columbia Business School. In June 2000, he married a woman named Hilary Aldama. But by the time he bumped into Jennifer Doulos at the airport, his marriage to Hillary was on the rocks. After meeting in Aspen, Jennifer and Fotis started communicating via email. In 2004, Fotis divorced his first wife, and just a month later, he and Jennifer tied the knot. The newlyweds moved to Farmington, Connecticut. That same year, Fotis formed a real estate company called Four Group Inc., that specialised in luxury homes. Fotis funded his venture using millions of dollars in loans from Jennifer's wealthy father. One of the things that had first attracted Jennifer to Fotis was the fact that he wanted to start a family. The couple would go on to have five kids, including two sets of twins. From the outside, it appeared as if Jennifer had it all, but stormy waters were just ahead. Despite having five very young children to look after, Jennifer never let go of her dream of becoming a writer. She maintained a blog and some of her posts offered glimpses into a marriage that was obviously becoming strained. In a 2012 post, she wrote, I wish I were a strong person and that confrontation did not both scare and appall me. Fotis also began to isolate Jennifer from her friends, a classic sign of abuse in any relationship. At the same time, Fotis started to isolate himself from his wife. He would be gone for days at a time, ostensibly on water skiing trips. Water skiing was a passion of Fotis's, and something that he demanded his children take part in also. Jennifer would later claim that Fotis expected all of his kids to grow up to become world-class water skiers and that it wasn't unusual for her kids to train from early in the morning until late in the evening. The children have told me that they do not want to water ski at this level, Jennifer later said. They are physically and emotionally exhausted and have begged me to do something about it. We are all terrified to disobey my husband. But then, in 2017, the same year that her father passed away, Jennifer discovered that Fotis had been having an affair with a woman named Michelle Trukonis. Like Fotis Doulos, Michelle Trukonis was an immigrant originally hailing from Venezuela. It appears as if Michelle Trukonis and Jennifer Doulos were almost polar opposites. Whereas Jennifer was introverted, Michelle was outgoing and bubbly. While Jennifer's favourite pastimes were reading and writing, Michelle was much more athletic and enjoyed an array of physical activities. She also happened to be a competitive water skier, and it's not difficult to imagine that Fotis would have found this particularly attractive given his own wife's aversion to the sport. It seems that Michelle Traconis fell just as hard for Fotis as he did for her, 
It was most definitely a mutual attraction. With her marriage now unsalvageable, Jennifer filed for divorce. She fled the Dulos family home in Farmington and rented a property 70 miles away in the town of New Canaan, taking her and Fotis' five kids with her. In her divorce documents, Jennifer stated, I know that filing for divorce will enrage him. I know he will retaliate by trying to harm me in some way. Two years later, Jennifer's premonition that she was now in harm's way would be proven correct. By May of 2019, Jennifer had been granted sole custody of her and Fotis' five children, with Fotis only entitled to supervised visits and phone calls that were monitored. On the 24th of that month, Jennifer had a busy day ahead of her. She had two doctor's appointments scheduled, one at 11am that morning for herself and another at 1pm that afternoon for her kids. The plan was for the children's nanny to pick them up from school and drive them to New York City where they would meet their mother. At 8am, Jennifer dropped off the kids at New Canaan Country School. Five minutes later, she was seen returning to her rented home on a neighbour's CCTV camera. At around 11am that morning, Jennifer's nanny, Lauren Almeida, arrived at the house. Lauren entered via the middle bay of the garage and immediately noticed something odd. Jennifer's Range Rover, the same car that she had used to bring the kids to school, was still present and a Chevrolet Suburban was missing. Even though Jennifer had already told Lauren that she would be using the Range Rover to go to New York City for her doctor's appointments. When Lauren entered the kitchen, she saw several more things that seemed to be a little bit strange. When you got to the kitchen, did you notice anything unusual? A couple things, yes. Tell the jury what you noticed. So first, her purse was on um, the floor. It was between the mudroom and the kitchen, like the doorway. It was a big, like, structured purse. And I thought it was just a little odd because it was a really nice handbag and it was on the floor. But I didn't look in the bag, so I just kind of figured she took her phone and her um, wallet with her to New York. And then when I entered the kitchen, her she always had a tea, like in a certain cup with her, and a granola bar. She ate it every morning. It was just part of her routine. And it was there. The tea was still full and the granola bar was still there. So I thought it was a little strange, but I just figured she was in a rush because I knew she had to get to the city. So I just cleaned the cup of tea and I put the granola bar away. As you were cleaning the cup of tea, did you notice the paper towel roll on the countertop near the sink? Yeah, so the paper towel roll was empty, so I went in the pantry to go grab another one and noticed that there were only two rolls of paper towels left, which was odd to me because I the night before I just put 12 rolls in there. Um, but again, I was, thought maybe the kids spilled something and they used a lot of paper towels. At around 12.30 p.m., Lauren went to pick up the kids from school. Four of Jennifer's kids went back to the house in New Canaan, while another went to a friend's house as they didn't have a doctor's appointment. After feeding the children their lunch, Lauren instructed them to get their iPods for the car journey into the city. One of the kids couldn't find their tablet, so Lauren sent a text to Jennifer, asking if it was okay for them to take the family tablet. Jennifer never responded to Lauren's message. The plan was for Lauren to meet Jennifer at Jennifer's mother's home in Manhattan, but when Lauren arrived there with the kids, Jennifer was nowhere to be found. Lauren tried calling her, but Jennifer never picked up. At this point, Lauren was wondering if perhaps Jennifer's own medical appointment was simply taking longer than expected. So she decided to take a cab to the orthodontist with the kids. While the children were going about their appointments, Lauren began to call different people who might have seen Jennifer but nobody had. By now, Lauren was starting to worry. After the kids were finished with their appointments, 
She looked through the family iPad and accessed Jennifer's Google Calendar, which told her where and when Jennifer's medical appointment was. Now acting more like a concerned friend than an employee, Lauren took it upon herself to go to where Jennifer's appointment had been scheduled. She was informed by staff that her boss had never even shown up. Lauren returned to Jennifer's mother's apartment and called the police. When detectives arrived at Jennifer's new Canaan home, they immediately discovered something that Lauren had not seen. Blood. A dark red stain was clearly visible on the floor of the garage and blood was also discovered on the exterior of the Range Rover. The same vehicle that Jennifer was supposed to take to her appointment in New York City on the day of her disappearance. Blood spotter was also uncovered on the garage door as well as one of the walls. When detectives searched the kitchen, some more blood was discovered on the faucet in the sink. This blood would later be found to be a mixture of Jennifer and Fotis Doulos' blood. The house was declared a crime scene. Naturally, detectives got to work on tracking the missing Chevrolet Suburban. It was captured driving away from Jennifer's house at 10.25 a.m. on the morning of her disappearance. But crucially, it wasn't possible to see who was actually driving the vehicle. It didn't take long to find the Chevrolet. It was discovered just three miles away, parked against a tree in a secluded area. On May 25th, 2019, the day after Jennifer went missing, Fotis Doulos willingly went to the police station to be interviewed by detectives. However, shortly after arriving, Fotis's lawyer told officers that his client would not be answering any questions. Fotis wasn't under arrest, but his cell phone was seized and officers got to work on securing a search warrant. This was eventually granted and when detectives tracked the device's location over the course of the previous day, they saw that it had been positioned inside Fotis Doulos' home on the morning of Jennifer's disappearance. Obviously, Fotis' defence team could argue that this points to their client's innocence, but it doesn't take a genius to work out that a person and their cell phone aren't always in the same place. However, when detectives dug deeper, they did uncover some unusual activity on Fotis' cell phone on the evening of May 24th. It was discovered that at approximately 7.30pm, Fotis was on Albany Avenue in Hartford. Detectives obtained CCTV footage from the area and what they found was nothing short of incredible. They zeroed in on a 2014 Ford Raptor that was registered to Fotis' real estate company. The driver of the vehicle was seen dumping trash bags into no fewer than 30 different trash cans. He was also seen disposing of something down a storm drain. Officers managed to obtain various pieces of bloodied clothing, including a shirt and a bra, from the trash cans, all of which tested positive for Jennifer's blood. They also uncovered zip ties and plastic ponchos. A search of the storm drain uncovered a pair of license plates. These license plates had been doctored with tape to read 5T6WBU, but in actual fact, the registration for the plates was 516. W. D. J. It was also noticed that the male driver was accompanied by a female passenger. Detectives believed that the man and woman seen on the CCTV were Fotis Doulos and his lover, Michelle Traconis. On June 1st, officers swooped on a hotel in the town of Avon and arrested the pair on suspicion of tampering with evidence and obstruction of justice. Jennifer's body still hadn't been found but given the amount of her blood that had been found so far during the investigation, in her garage, in her kitchen, on her clothing recovered from the trash cans, it was felt by most that Jennifer had almost certainly 
been murdered. When interviewed, Michelle Traconis freely admitted that she and Fotis wore the coupled scene disposing of evidence in the trash cans in Hartford. She also provided her boyfriend with an alibi for the morning of Jennifer's disappearance. Michelle insisted that Fotis had been lying next to her when she woke up on the morning of May 24th. She told detectives that the two had then showered together. Officers searched Fotis's house and uncovered a series of notes that became known as the alibi script. These notes offered highly detailed descriptions of just about everything both Fotis and Michelle had done on May 24th. Every innocuous detail is recorded, such as Michelle jotting down that she made scrambled eggs with her then nine-year-old daughter. Detectives suspected that these timelines pointed towards Michelle's involvement in the planning of Jennifer's presumed murder. It seemed as if the couple had written the notes ahead of time, perhaps for the purpose of committing them to memory in case they were interviewed by detectives. After several interviews, Michelle told detectives that on the afternoon of the 24th, Fotis had called her up and asked her to come to 80 Mountain Spring Road. Fotis claimed that the house needed to be cleaned in preparation for a client meeting the next morning. In actual fact, 80 Mountain Spring Road was the house that Jennifer and her children were now living in, and it sat just two miles away from Fotis's Farmington residence. Michelle claimed that she began washing windows in the house, but gave up as the house was just too big. On another occasion, she told detectives that she had also been cleaning bathrooms in the property. Michelle also stated that at one point, Fotis had approached her and asked for some paper towels, supposedly to clean up some coffee that he had spilt in a friend's vehicle. This vehicle was a Toyota Tacoma that belonged to one of Fotis's employees, a project manager named Paul Gomeni. Detectives discovered that on May 29th, 2019, Fotis drove the Toyota Tacoma pickup truck to Russell Spader's car wash in Avon. Michelle joined him there in a separate vehicle. Fotis paid $250 in cash to have the truck thoroughly cleaned. He did this without Paul's knowledge or permission. The detail log for the job would show that the name field had been left blank and the vehicle was described as being a Toyota Sienna, which is false. On June 6, detectives swooped in and seized the Tacoma. Paul Gumeni willingly told officers that Fotis had told him to replace the front seats of the truck. He stated that the two front seats currently installed in the vehicle were from a Porsche Fotis had once owned. Fortunately, Paul had held on to the old seats. The seats that would have been installed in the Tacoma on the day of Jennifer's disappearance. They were sent away for analysis and Jennifer's blood was found on the passenger seat. Paul also told detectives about a bicycle that Fotis owned. This bicycle was very rare and was in fact from Fotis's childhood. He was so fond of it that he'd had it shipped to the US when he emigrated. Paul stated that the bicycle was usually kept in Fotis's garage but Jennifer Traconis recalled seeing such a bicycle at Jennifer's house when she was there cleaning. Surveillance footage showed somebody dressed in a hoodie and dark clothing cycling towards Jennifer's house early that morning. By now, detectives were forming a theory. On the morning of May 24th, 2019, Fotis Doulos cycled to Jennifer's home. There, he ambushed and murdered her after she did the school run, most likely in the garage. He then bundled Jennifer's body inside her Chevrolet Suburban and drove to the spot where it would later be found. He then moved Jennifer's body to the Toyota Tacoma, which was parked there ahead of time. 
On January 7, 2020, Connecticut State Police arrested Fotis at his home. He was subsequently charged with capital murder and kidnapping. His girlfriend, Michelle Draconis, was charged with conspiracy to commit murder. Fotis made bail, but on January 28, 2020, he failed to appear in court for a hearing. Officers went to his home and found him unconscious behind the wheel of one of his vehicles. Despite protesting his innocence in the preceding days, he had attempted to kill himself via carbon monoxide poisoning. Despite doctors' best efforts, he would pass away two days later at the age of 52. Fotis left a brief suicide note that read, I refuse to spend even an hour more in jail for something I had nothing to do with. With Fotis now dead, attention turned to his co-accused Michelle. On March 1st, she was found guilty of conspiring with her ex-boyfriend to murder Jennifer. Michelle was also found guilty of two counts of conspiracy to commit murder two counts of conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence and two counts of tampering with physical evidence. She faces a sentence of up to 50 years behind bars.